That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about the best and worst of the 2023 Cannes Film Festival, the 76th edition of the event. How many films did you see? 65 of the program as of today. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So you want to start with the films you liked the least. Yeah, I thought I'd run down, you know, after that many films, I, I saw some turkeys. Uh, but yeah, I, I compiled my list of my five least favorite out of all of those. So number five. Uh, Salem by Jean-Bernard Marlin, which is part of the Uncertain Regard category. Uh, it's kind of giving a, trying to do that Romeo Juliet West Side Story thing about two rival gangs from different projects known as the Locusts and the Crickets. And it has some supernatural components that I don't think work very well. I just ended up thinking it was very cheesy, very long. I had some of, there's a lot of French genre films that are also trying to um, incorporate uh, certain uh, political facets in them. Like uh, I, I think the Five Devils I had some problems with. How they're trying to incorporate significant race issues I think in modern day France as well. That, that It doesn't quite coalesce. I liked the idea of the film but I thought it was hard to sit through. Number four. The Other Lorenz uh, was part of the director's Fortnite, directed by Claude Schmitz, uh, whose previous films I don't believe I've seen. Uh, this is about a man who is a, is a twin and a private investigator. His brother, who he's estranged from, dies, and his niece comes to fetch him to investigate. And again, the bones of the story are interesting, but there's some... A, a lot of times um, when... Uh, a, a director who's not well versed in English casts a prominent English language role. It it doesn't play well, and there's there's a woman in this who it, all of the English language parts I think are really quite terrible. But I, I did not enjoy this film. Number three, Asteroid City, the latest film from Wes Anderson, which uh, I know a lot of people did like this film. I think that Wes Anderson has been delivering for quite some time now a bunch of empty spectacles, uh, fussy narratives that are kind of given this Russian doll syndrome to distract us from the fact that no one's having an authentic human emotion in his films anymore. Uh, but despite having a, a highly impressive cast, I thought it was, a, despite a nice looking film, uh, because, you know, he's maybe unparalleled in production design, uh, uh, just an, an empty film that made me feel like there's something wrong with me. Number two... Number two, Hopeless, uh, is a debut in the in certain regard, uh, South Korean film from Kim Chang Hoon, uh, and its film, its title indicates the sense of miserableism that it's going for about these lost young adults uh, that are inflicted with generational trauma uh, from, from abusive alcoholic parents. It's extremely violent, uh, but in a, in a way that doesn't make sense for the amount of uh, violence that some of these main characters go through and that are inflicted upon them with weaponry and are still just fine. Uh, th this was also a, a patience enduring film and with a, a very predictable payoff. Hmm. And number one. Number one is A Brighter Tomorrow, the latest film from Nanny Moretti, who I also haven't liked for quite some time. It just feels like it, this condescending grandfather that needs to stop making cinema. Uh, and again, uh, it's the first time he's... He, because quite often throughout his work, he's starred as himself in the same kind of persona that he already always has. But this is the first one in a while where he's taken center stage. Uh, he's got Margarita Bai in it, uh, a bunch of other people that he likes to work with. And it's about a film director making a, a period piece in 1950s Hungary about the invasion of the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, anyway, I thought this was incredibly insufferable. It's also a musical. I just get the sense that Moretti thinks he's cute, and of course, he's very, very well regarded in Italy. Uh, I don't know how well outside of that, but I, this, I thought, was kind of a despicable piece of film, and it's very tiring that he keeps getting um, positioned in the can competition, in my opinion. Okay, now on to the, your favorites. You do my top 10 favorites. I have an honorable mention shout out to a performance that I loved in a film that I didn't like, but Bertrand Bandico's latest film, Conan, also known as She is Conan, which is kind of a uh, recapitulation of the Conan the Barbarian myth told throughout through women. Uh, Alina Lowenstone, who is in his other two films, is Rainer the, the Satanic Dog. So she's, you don't even know it's her because she's wearing a dog mask the, through the whole thing in a kind of this fest. Fassbenderian jacket. I was fascinated by this performance. I cannot wait to uh, 
have you watched this film with me? I absolutely loved her in it, even though the film doesn't quite work for me and I wish Mandico would kind of step out a little bit and kind of pay a little more attention to narrative. We reviewed his last film, After Blue, which I was a fan of. Uh, yeah, just pretty amazing performance from her. Number 10. Number 10, I have A Prince, uh, directed by Pierre Creton, which is part of the director's Fortnite. Uh, I haven't seen his previous two films, I believe. This is kind of a strangely unclassi unclassifiable film in a lot of ways. It's only 80 minutes, but it's bizarre, and it's very gay. Uh, it's about a young uh, criminal turned uh, horticultural apprentice, uh, and the film is graced with very long monologues that are voiced by other actors like Francois Lebrun and Mathieu Malric. Lebrun is also has, has an on-screen role in this as well. But uh, he... There's this character that keeps getting referenced that, uh, that doesn't show up until the end that has these m m Medusa hair penis that is very interesting. Uh, it is, uh, yeah, again, a very queer film, a very dense film for its 80 minutes, and uh, will keep you guessing about where it's going until the end. And I quite enjoyed it. Number nine. Number nine, Anatomy of a Fall. The... Uh, I think, fourth film directed by Justine Trier, uh, which has a fantastic Sandra Hüller uh, in the lead role as this uh, German woman living in uh, France, right outside of Grenoble, uh, and sh her husband suddenly dies one day, and the only two people at home are her blind, pre-adolescent child and herself, and it looks suspicious because it it looks like he was pushed out of a window on the top floor of this chalet. Uh, so, and it's co-written by Arthur Harari. It's got some really great, authentic dialogue between this couple that's kind of going back and forth on how they feel about each other, lots of resentment and lots of jealousy. And then the second half of the film is a courtroom drama uh, that, uh, again, is expertly written and performed. Number eight. Number eight, I, technically it's uh, Wang Bing. I, I have a number eight because he had two uh, items that I both really liked. His In the competition, he had uh, Youth, a, a.k.a. Spring, which is the first part of a trilogy about these, uh, these young people in China working in this particular city, uh, textile manufacturing, if you will, and the title is kind of ironic about how basically their, their youth is being sucked away uh, in, in this industry that they're frittering away their time on, but I thought it was kind of moving and a, lot, a bit, uh, a little less stationary, a bit more jaunty for a three-hour Wang Bing documentary. But I probably give the edge to this film he had out of competition. It was only 40 minutes. Uh, it's about uh, m probably China's most notable uh, modern composer, uh, Wang Shilin, who, whose music I was unfamiliar with, but it's, it's this composer who's in his 80s, completely naked in an abandoned auditorium as his, some of his most famous pieces are kind of crashing around him, and his music sounds a lot like Stravinsky, so of course I was a fan, and uh, he's telling his story about kind of the extreme torture, the labor camps he had to go through uh, as a youth um, in, in the political shifting landscape of uh, China, it, it, and it's fascinating and harrowing and, I, I don't know, pretty intense, and I liked it. Does it have a name? Man in Black, sorry, is the name of that uh, medium-length film. Number seven. Number seven, The Pot of Faux. Uh, Pot of Faux, the directed by Tran An Hung, a Vietnamese filmmaker. It's a French film. This is kind of a return to form for him, uh, set in the Belle Epoque uh, era of France. It's about a master gastronomist who's called the Napoleon of Gastronomy, played by Benoit Majumel, who apparently just lives in his manor and just eats good food and all day. Uh, it's a three-hour film. It's kind of like, uh, if you like Babette's Feast, I, I think you'll, you'll really dig this film. It, it is very sumptuous and opulent, but it's about his relationship with his cook of 20 years, played by Juliette Binoche, who's also his lover, uh, who's having some health problems. And I'll leave it at that, but it will make you very, very hungry watching it. And Majumel and Binoche are interesting because they had a high-profile romance in the late 90s when they met and had a kid together, and they have not been together in some time. But uh, they, had, they do have a really uh, interesting, lovely chemistry. It's a, it's a very lovely film. Number six. Number six. Also a lovely film, uh, Fallen Leaves, the directed, the latest film directed by Aki Karzmaki, who very much, if you're familiar with his filmography, is doing what he is good at doing. Uh, but if you're unfamiliar, you might just fall in love with 
his film. Uh, it's starring Alma Poisty, uh, who, late, who recently uh, portrayed Tova Janssen, uh, and Yossi Vaitan, Vaitanen, who I'm uh, as unfamiliar with, who kind of looks like a young David Lynch to me. Anyway, it's the usual themes in a Korsmaki film. He's a drunk industrial worker, and she is a, starts out as a, a clerk in a supermarket, and they're both lonely, isolated people that fall in love. Uh, but it has a lot of references to uh, Korsmaki's uh, favored cinematic technicians, if you will. Uh, I, I really liked it. Number five. Uh, Blackbird, Blackbird, Blackberry. It's the second film from a Georgian director, Aline Naveriani, whose first film, Wet Sand, is also really worth checking out, was at Locarno that year. Uh, this, her latest, was in the director's Fortnite, has a fantastic lead performance from a woman that starred in her last film, Eka, my, my, don't judge my English wooden tongue, but uh, Shadlishvili uh, is the lead, uh, who's this woman that's kind of a pariah in her small community. She owns a shop and she really enjoys her uh, time alone. And she's also a virgin and she suddenly gets hit on the head uh, and almost dies in the early uh, portion of the film, but thanks to the intervention of this black bird, and she uh, suddenly has a sexual awakening. That's very interesting. I, I quite loved it, especially for the central performance. Number four. This was not a beloved film by many, but I loved it. It is the uh, first film in a decade from Catherine Breyat, who is, who is uh, one of the best modern filmmakers, especially in explorations of female sexuality that is not taking some moral high ground. And her latest is also uh, of that ilk. It's a remake of a 2019 film called Queen of Hearts, a Danish film starring Trina Deerholm. Her latest stars Leia Drucker and Samuel Kirker, who's uh, the young teenage boy in question. His older brother is in... Is uh, it called Queen of Hearts? It's called Last Summer, the oh, remake. Okay. His older brother's in Anori's latest film, Winter Boy. And he's kind of got this Bjorn Anderson look of... Um, from Death in Venice. And basically it's a kind of an incest story, although they're not the bloodline, but it's about this older woman that starts having a torrid sexual affair uh, with her teenage 15 year old uh, stepson and kind of how things go haywire from there. Uh, but I've seen the original, great Trina Deerholm performance, but this one is much more complex and it's, it's subverting something that's already really subversive uh, and it, it's supposed to make you uncomfortable and question who is this woman I'm watching and should I have any kind of allegiance with her by the end? Probably not, but uh, fascinating. I loved it. Number three. Number three, About Dry Grasses, the latest film by Turkish auteur uh, Nuri Bilga Ceylan. Uh, also, as a lot of his films are, quite lengthy, three hours, uh, co-written by his wife, who's written some of his things, but some of the best uh, cinematic writing, dialogue writing. And uh, Denise Celi... Shelley Kolu is the lead, uh, who's kind of giving me Jack Nicholson vibes from the 70s as this teacher in this outpost, uh, this small backwater Turkish town that clearly he's tired of being it. He, he's, clear, he's clearly disillusioned about being a teacher and doesn't give a damn about his uh, kids, but he has kind of a boundary issue he's crossing with a, a favorite pupil of his that gets him into trouble when she doesn't like something he does. Uh, and there's also this relationship he has with a teacher from another town, over, played by Marve Dizdar, who gives an excellent, she's, she's fantastic. Uh, and she's kind of giving me Barbara Steele vibes in this, but uh, it's interesting and ends in a way I, I didn't quite expect, considering how unlikable this man becomes as we're uh, following with him, but uh, yeah. Number two. Number two. I cannot wait for you to see this. Uh, it's the latest film from Todd Haynes, May, December, starring Julianne Moore and Natalie Portman. And a uh, young man I'm not familiar with named Charles Melton, who I thought gave a really moving performance. And this is also kind of in, uh, in the same vein as the Brayot film is these women, uh, it's kind of a Mary Kay Letourneau story. It's about Julianne Moore plays this woman who had a relationship with a 13-year-old boy who she later ended up marrying when he was legally of age after the public outcry subsided. And Natalie Portman is the woman who's playing her in a, an upcoming film and who's doing some research on her. And that, that family tend, happens to be on another major precipice because the youngest kids he had with Julianne Moore are about to graduate from high school when his own life was kind of arrested irrevocably and how he's feeling about that. But uh, it is like if, you know, how Brian De Palma was basically remaking Hitchcock films, 
because this has a fantastic uh, and very invasive score, but it, it reminded me of De Palma was doing Douglas Sirk remakes instead. Number one. Number one, which, are, you know, the irony of it is, is this a film I like, I love? It, it's it's not a film that's meant to be liked or loved. It's a, it's a film that's meant to terrify uh, and kind of astound, but it's Jonathan Glazer's The Zone of Interest, which is li- very loosely based on a 2014 novel by Martin Amis uh, about uh, the commandant of Auschwitz and his wife. And there's really no structure except we're watching these people and we the, the violence is happening off screen, but you can hear in the soundtrack, you know, the things that are going on right next door over this wall. Uh, but it, it's disturbing. I actually saw it twice, which is a, a rarity that a schedule would even allow for that in Cannes, but I, I watched it the first time and I, I felt like I needed to see it again. Uh, and it'll stick with you. Uh but yeah, to, to say I like it and love it, I don't know. But to me, this was the best piece of filmmaking at this year's film festival, probably of the year. And then the awards. The awards. Like uh, the main ones. Yeah, the Ruben Ostland led jury. Uh, so I had assumed Zone of Interest would win, but it won the second place prize. The top winner was Anatomy of a Fall, uh, making Justine Trier the third woman to win the Palme d'Or uh, of all time. Uh, and I can see why. And it's deserving of that. I think Glazer has the edge, but I can. it's kind of like in 2015 when Son of Saul won the second place prize. It's like, what are we trying to award here? I, I understand why the jury probably didn't want to reflect that, to give that this uh, platform, but I don't know. It, it, it was fine with me. But so uh, Anatomy won, Zone of Interest was second place. Third place prize was the, the, the jury prize was Daki Karazmaki. Best director went to Tran An Hung for Potafo. Um, best screenplay went to Koreeda's Monster, which also won the Queer Palm, uh, which I, I was fine with that as well. Uh, the best actress went to, uh, I'm blinking on who is best actress now. Oh, Marve Dizdar from About Dry Grasses, which I thought, this was a really good year for actresses in the uh, main competition because both her, Sandra Hewler, uh, Natalie Portman, uh, I thought were all uh, fantastic. Uh, it was no surprise to me that Koji Akusho won best actor uh, for the Vim Vendors, uh, Perfect Days, which I also really liked. It's kind of a return to form for Vim Vendors because I haven't liked anything he's done in a minute um, about a toilet cleaner in Tokyo. Uh, it, it, that was kind of, you knew that he was going to win, uh, and I think that's all the, I think that's all the major awards. But uh, so uh, not truly disappointed by the Ruben Ostland led jury, but I, um, it was a good festival. Well, that's good to hear. Mm-hmm. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>